Welcome. In this video, we're going to be going over our multiple choice questions for unit nine. This is chapter, uh, section 12.3 in your textbook. It's going to be going over regression type multiple choice questions, talking about inference for slope. And you'll find these in pages eight, nine, and 10 in this handout here in this bit.ly link. Let's get started. Number one, as part of a class project at a large university, Anthony asked a random sample of 12 students in his major field of study. All students in the sample were asked to report their number of hours spent studying the final exam and their score on the final exam. A regression analysis on the data produced the following partial computer output. And you have all these numbers here. The question is, Anthony wants to compute a 95% confidence interval for the slope of the least squares regression line in the population of all students in her major field of study. Assuming that conditions for inference are satisfied, which of the following gives the margin of error for the confidence interval? When you do your margin of error, it's always going to be composed of your critical value multiplied by your standard error. Now we're given our standard error. The standard error is in this problem is always going to be the SE of the slope. So you have uh, our critical value, which is going to be T star times 0 0.745, which is right up here in the table. Well, the T star you can get from your table B. Since we have a sample size of 12, our degree of freedom is going to be 12 minus 2, which is 10. Um, if you meet that, match that up to the 95% confidence level, you're going to get 2.228. So that'll be your, um, your critical value. That'll be your T star. And we have an answer that matches up with that. Answer choice A. Let's move on to number two. Number two, the residual plots from five different least squares regression lines are shown below. Which of the plots provides the strongest evidence that its regression line is an appropriate model for the data and is consistent with the assumptions required for inference or regression? Well, there's a couple that have patterns. That's got a curved pattern. We don't want that. This one has a kind of a absolute value pattern almost. That's kind of weird. We're not going to use that. This one's pretty equally distributed. I like that. That's got that equal standard deviation. So that's your good candidate there. I'm, I'm feeling that's good here. This one fans out a little bit. Notice that's kind of getting smaller as it goes to the right. This one's kind of the opposite. It gets bigger as it goes to the right. So these two are no go because they don't have that equal standard deviation. This is the only one that's going to match that. Um, so if you're looking for an explanation, you would say this, this one kind of meets the equal standard deviation, whereas these two are not meeting that. And these two just have patterns in the residual plot. So those are even worse. Um, that's the only one that's going to work. Number two for part C. All right, number three. A car retailer wanted to see if there's a linear relationship between overall mileage and the suggested real retail price of a car. The retailer collected data on 18 cars of a similar type selected at random and used the data to test the claim that there is a linear relationship. The following hypotheses were used to test the claim. The null is B equals zero, no, no linear relationship. The alternative is B is not equal to zero. There is a linear relationship. A test yielded a T value of 2.186 with a corresponding P value of 0 0.044. Which of the following is the correct interpretation of this P value? Um, that's a mouthful, but let's go for the generic interpretation first. The p-value generic interpretation is basically saying, assuming the null is true. So in this case, assuming there is no linear relationship, the probability of observing results as extreme as what we saw in our sample is whatever the p-value is. So with this question, um, the null being true is going to imply that there is no linear relationship. So assuming there's not a linear relationship, rules out A and E, because A and E lead with if there is a linear relationship. So those are done. Now let's look at the next part. The probability of observing results as extreme as what we saw in our sample is. So look at the rest of it. If there is not a linear relationship between overall mileage and suggested retail price of the car, the probability of observing a test statistic at least as extreme as 2.186 is 0 0.044. That's good wording. Let's look at the other ones. If there is not a linear relationship between overall mileage and the suggested retail price of the car, 
the probability of observing a test statistic of 2.186 or greater is 0 0.044. That also sounds pretty good, but it's not quite as good as the one above here, and I'll explain why in a little bit. D, if there is not a linear relationship between overall mileage and the suggested retail price of the car, the probability of observing a test statistic of 2.186 is 0 0.044. Uh, zero is four four. The big problem with that one is it doesn't say as extreme. Okay, so this is just the probability of observing that one specific test statistic, and that's not even going to be true. Okay, we, we, we try to get a range of values. It's a shaded region. So we're going to rule out this one because it doesn't have or more extreme. And the reason why it's going to be B as opposed to C is because it says this one specifically says or greater. But this isn't just a one-sided test. This is a two-sided test. So it's it could be greater or it could be less. So we have to say at least as extreme to, to kind of be more generic about it since this is a two-sided test. So when you see that wording on there, um, if it were just a, a greater than test and not a not equal to test, absolutely you'd want to pick C. But in this case here, since it's at least as extreme, it could be below negative 2.186 or above positive 2.186. That's going to be your better choice. So answer choice B is where we want to be. And of course, we're going to rule out D as we did earlier and C. So those are no good on this one. Question four. Which of the following is not one of the conditions that must be satisfied in order to perform inference about the slope of a least squares regression line? I just want to say I'm, I'm not a huge fan of this question. Um, the way that it's worded is, is kind of awkward, but let me go through in each each one of these and kind of explain which, which conditions work. So A, for the value of X, the population of Y values is normally distributed. That's just a fancy way of saying the normal condition is met. Um, so what we're looking for is residuals. Not uh, skewed, heavily skewed, and no outliers. That's that's what part A is, and that really uh, that the wording on there can get you. So, but that that's what it's talking about. All right, part B, uh, the standard deviation of the population of y values corresponding to a particular value of x is always the same regardless of the specific value of X. The standard deviation of the population of Y values corresponding to the particular value of X is always the same. And I don't like that wording. It should, it should be roughly the same, not always the same. But what that is talking about is equal standard deviation. And that's, that's the condition we need to meet here. So we're going to not choose that answer because that's that that is a condition we're looking for. Part C, the sample size, that is the number of paired observations, exceeds 30. We do not have this this magic. I need to have 30 in our sample. This there is no central limit theorem for slope. Okay, that does not apply for slope. So that's going to be your answer. The other two conditions right here. There exists a straight line y equals a plus bx such that for each value of x, the mean of the y's of the corresponding population of y values lies on the straight line. So that's just the way of saying linear. Um, that is, that's meeting your linear condition. And we do want to we, we do want to look for evidence of a straight line. So yes. And then the last one, the data come from a random sample or a randomized experiment. That's your random condition. So we have to have LIN linear, 10% or independent if we're sampling without replacement, which isn't one of our, our conditions that was mentioned here. Normal condition, equal standard deviation, and random. What we don't care about is the sample size. We could have a, a 100 data points or five or six. And as long as all the other conditions are met, you're going to be fine. 
Number five, biologists are interested in how temperature changes might affect the frequency of mating calls of frogs. 20 gray tree frogs are randomly chosen for a study. For each frog, the temperature of its habitat in degrees Celsius and the frequency of its mating call in tones per second are recorded. The 96% confidence interval for estimating the population slope of a linear regression line predicting mating call frequency based on habitat temperature is given by 2.341 plus or minus 0 0.768. Assume that the conditions for inference for the slope of the regression line have been met. Which of the following is the correct interpretation for the calculated confidence interval? So we are 96% confident that the increase in mating call frequency for of an individual frog when its habitat temperature increases by one degree Celsius is between 1.573 and 3.109 tones per second. We can't use that, of course, because it says we are 96% confident that the increase in the mating call frequency of an individual frog, and we're not we're not making a prediction for one subject, so it's not going to be a. B, we are 96% confident that the average increase in mating call frequency in the sample of frogs when habitat temperature increases by one degree Celsius, yada, yada, yada. Again, we're not, we're not making inference on a sample, we're making inference on a population. Not, not a sample, not one individual, so it cannot be B. C, we are 96% confident that the average increase in mating call frequencies in the population of frogs, that's good wording, when habitat temperature increases by one degree Celsius is between 1.573 and 3.109 tones per second. We can do that because we did a random sample of frogs, randomly chosen. So we can make inferences to a population. That would be your answer. Let's look at why the other two are wrong. We are 96% confident that the average increase in habitat temperature in a sample of frogs, again, we don't want to use sample of frogs, and E, we are 96% confident that the average increase of habitat temperature in the population of frogs, that's good wording, when mating call frequency increases, oh, no, no, that's your Y value. We want X to be the one that's increasing. So when, uh, when the increase in temperature is your X, then the Y value predicted is gonna be between the, this and this. So. It's all about the X when you're interpreting slope. X increases by one unit. The predicted Y is this number. All right, number six. A high school basketball coach wants to see whether there is a linear relationship between player height, X, and the number of points scored in a game by basketball players in the coach's state, Y. The 96% confidence interval to estimate the slope of a linear regression line relating player height to points scored in a game is calculated to be between negative 0.432 and 1.844. Assume all conditions for inference for the slope of a regression line are met. Based on the confidence interval, which of the following claims is supported by the confidence interval? Well, I'm going to look at that claim and, uh, you know, I'm going to look at the fact that zero is in there and that's probably a big clue that it's going to kind of involve that number. So look at letter A, each player scored at most 1.844 points per game. We don't, that's definitely not true. We have a range of values. B, the average difference between actual points scored and predicted points scored is between negative 0.432 and 1.844. That's talking about residuals, average difference between actual and predicted. This is not a residual. So we can't really do anything with that for a confidence interval. C, there is a positive linear relationship between player height and number of points scored for basketball players in the coach's state. No, we can't make that conclusion because zero is in the interval. So zero is in interval. So there is not necessarily a positive relationship, nor is there a negative. Same reason, there's not, there's not a negative linear relationship necessarily because zero is in the interval. So it could be positive or negative. E, it cannot be determined whether the linear relationship between player height and number of points scored for basketball players. And that's because zero is in the interval. So it cannot be determined. Zero is in the interval. E is going to be your answer. Our last question. 
Seven, to investigate the relationship between the selling price of a house, Y in dollars, and the size of a house, X in square feet. A local builder collected data on a random sample of 120 houses from a certain region. Assume that the conditions for inference for the slope of a regression line are met. The resulting 95% confidence interval for the population slope of the regression line relating price and size is given by 62 to 99. The local builder claims that the selling price of houses from the region increases by $104 for every extra square foot of space in the house. Which of the following best describes the conclusion that can be reached about this claim based on the confidence interval? Well, the conclusion, anything that that interval is going to give you a range of plausible values. So if you're if you're given a number outside of that range of values, then that interval does not simply support that conclusion. Um, so letter A, the claim is supported by the interval since the interval does not contain the value of zero. Well, that's not even remotely close to zero. So that's that's not really what we're trying to show here. B, the claim is supported by the interval since all values in the interval are positive. Again, the claim is 104, and that interval doesn't contain 104. So C, the claim is supported by the interval since the interval does not contain the value 104. No, it's not supported. The claim is not supported by the interval since the interval does not contain zero. No, not zero. The claim is not supported by the interval since the interval does not contain the value 104. 104 is not in the interval, so we can't support the claim that 104 is the actual price or plausible price or average price or whatever we're talking about here. It's not in the interval. That is it, guys. That should be all the questions. Thank you for watching this video, and you have a fantastic day. Study and get ready for your Unit 8, 9 test or whatever you're taking. See ya.